and welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, episode number 203. Hope you're gonna have an amazing weekend. Let's get right to it. Hey, Glenn, the other day, me and some friends were wondering who used Line 6. We searched it up and learned that Billy Sheehan, my favorite bass player, and Fluff used Line 6, so I was wanting to know if you think that higher tier Line 6 is good. Oh, okay, uh, wow, not much of a fucking difficult question there. Uh, as you guys know, I'm not a big fan of the lower end Line 6 stuff. I've never had any luck with the pod. I know some guys have, but for me, it's just never fucking sounded good. Um, I absolutely hate the Spider series, and I've had to argue with I don't know how many guitar players over the years about bringing those horrible fucking amps into my studio and trying to get great tones with them. Because uh, let's be honest here, I've never heard a spider sound great on a major label record. Um, if some, if I'm wrong, somebody please point me in the right direction. Now, the Helix on the other hand is actually really fucking cool. Um, one of the coolest fucking recordings I've heard in a long time came from my friend Lee Daffron's band. And unfortunately right now I forget the name of the band and I'm gonna get a very angry email over this. I know it already, but uh, the drum sound was incredible and the guys were using a Helix and it sounded great. So yes, the good stuff is very good. Um, not only the Helix is great, their wireless systems are great as well. Just don't get the lower end ones because the housing is made out of Kleenex. The more robust ones are definitely worth the investment. So yes, cheers to Line 6 on, on the, the higher end stuff. Yes, they're doing a good job at it. Um, the other thing I wanna do is check out maybe the Spider Valve. So what, what that is, is a Spider front end with a tube output section uh, made by Bogner. And um, I was over at Allwork Wilds there a couple weeks back, we did a video and he had one of those kicking around. He's like, yeah, it's actually pretty good. So I'm probably gonna see if I can get my hands on one and demo one at some point, because I definitely think it's worth investigating. Glenn, what should a band do if the guitarists are using different wattage amps? Would that affect live sound or recording sound in any way? Dude, I think you're overthinking it. All you gotta do is you know make sure the amps are reasonably at the same volume and you should be fine. Generally, I find amps work on a ramp as opposed to just a straight linear curve. So when you start turning the volume up, they're gonna get really loud really fast. Doesn't matter the wattage. One of the loudest amps I own is a 40 watt trainer from the 60s. And yeah, that thing can just melt concrete. I've said that numerous times. It's just insanely loud. So don't get too hung up on wattage and all that kind of thing. Is it loud enough? Yes. Is it loud enough to keep up with the other amp? Yes. Okay, then don't fucking worry about it. Same with the studio. Doesn't fucking matter because shit's gonna get mic'd up and mixed on a board or in software anyway. Yeah. So stop worrying about it and worry about more important things like writing good songs. We need those. Hi Glenn, congratulations on 200 episodes. Regarding playing on stage, when do you think the band is ready to hit the stage? Our bass player, surprisingly the most capable person in the band, doesn't want to play live until we play every song perfectly, but the rest of the band thinks it's okay to make a few mistakes when you play in a bar for almost no income. The thing is that after a casual jam session, we have been contacted by well-known and serious organizers who are in the audience and want us to play at their place. I think they wouldn't book a band they don't. I'm divided over the issue. Our fans deserve respect and should be provided with the most professional and intense show possible, even if we are just beginners. But on the other hand, if we never play live, I don't see the point making music at all. Moreover, I think nobody is expecting perfection from a band who only started a few months ago. Kind regards from France. That's a fucking phenomenal question. Um, I think your bass player might be a little insecure uh, with you guys and is probably nervous about making, you know, you guys look bad right out of the gate. Here's the thing though, you guys need to play live to develop your show. You need time to be bad before you're good. The, one of the reasons that the Beatles became such a huge act is because they spent all that time in Hamburg working on their show. They'd play like eight, 10 hours a day live all the time and got to be a really incredible live band. So if you have an opportunity to play, then fucking take it. Go fucking play. Like I said, you're going to need time to work at your act. And the best way you can do that is on a stage. You guys should not only be playing bars, you should be playing parties, clubs, any, anywhere you guys can play. You should be bringing your gear there, setting up and rocking the fuck out, even if it's only for two or three people. Get out there and do it and work on that show because eventually you will become good. Best of luck, dude. Holy fuck, dead serious. Our last band's drummer and lead guitarist checked all the bad things on this list. We eventually broke up while recording our third album. Drums were mic'd and ready to go and he couldn't get through the first song. He said he just wasn't feeling this whole thing anymore. What the fuck? When a drummer says he just isn't feeling this anymore, what he's really saying is he was too fucking lazy to practice. Your drummer was such a fucking coward. He couldn't speak up and say, 
Um, I never learned this stuff. We better not go into the studio. No, he actually got it to the point where he bullshitted himself that he let you guys set up his kit, mic it up, get the tones, get ready, and then just not fucking do it. He actually thought he was going to be able to pull off some fucking bullshit where he'd be able to wing it through a recording session. There's really no excuse for that level of unprofessionalism. Uh, wow, I don't know what you guys did in that situation, but I really feel bad for you. My suggestion in this situation to avoid this problem is make sure you make pre-recordings before you go into the studio of the band jamming to make sure everybody knows their fucking parts. Uh, when I recorded with a band called Chaos, I was singing in a band years and years and years ago, we did daily recordings and checked them to make sure we were ready before we walked in the studio. We just threw a little tape deck up at the end of the room and did it every single day until we had the part dead nuts. We came in and we kicked ass and we got a good record. That's how it's done, folks, not flounder your way through your fucking tracks. A question for anyone, really. I want to start slash join a band, but work 40 hours a week. Would two rehearsals, a practice sessions a week be too few? Long story short, I'm open on off days and only have an hour or two in the morning on work days. Dude, I not only managed to be in a band, but I managed to run a recording studio working 48 hours a week for 25 fucking years. Yes, yes, you can make it happen. It just depends on you and how dedicated you are into making it happen for you. You know, if say, oh, well, I've got a day job. Well, fucking make time. Just choose your fucking priorities. If, if you want to be in a band, be in a band. I did to wind up taking a lot of time off during my whole run in manufacturing. And, um, you know, I'd take like three day weekends sometimes, but a lot of times I was working 48 hours a week and just made it happen. Same thing when I was in a band, you just work around everybody's work schedule. And that usually means spending your weekends rehearsing the, with the band. We do uh, two two hour jam sessions every week. We practice at home and then we bring our stuff to rehearsal and go through the set and then we'd work on new stuff. And that was our routine and that worked out pretty damn well. And we all had jobs, but somehow we made it work. Guess what? Nobody gives a shit. Ah, that was so good. You're referencing my uh, episode 200 when I was talking, what the guy called me a loser in high school. Uh, that is the thing. Anybody who in the adult world who brings up people's high school careers is gonna get looked at like there's some kind of pariah. Oh, that guy was a loser back in high school. Who gives a fuck? Nobody. You know why? Because high school is for fucking teenagers and adults don't want anything to do with that shit. Seriously, the only people who bring up people's high school careers are absolute fucking losers in the real world. You know, I get it. You know, when you're in high school, you're meant to think this all means something and it's super fucking important because that's what the teachers brainwash you with. Oh, you know, you you better get your shit together here because that's going to affect out how you're looked at in the, in the, in the working world. Well, no, it's not. All anybody gives a shit is, did you fucking get your diploma? Did you pass? That's it, you know, because high school isn't so much about the education. It's more about, can you take it? Can you deal with it? Can you deal with the, the system in place? Can you endure it? That's really what it comes down to. If you can't make it through high school, nobody's gonna fucking take you seriously. I mean, like, it's the most basic of challenges. If you're looking for a job and you don't have a high school diploma, it means, you're not reliable enough, it means you can't deal with that. That's all high school means, nothing more. The social structures, the cliques, all that fucking bullshit that goes along with it is completely meaningless in the adult world. So if you're in high school and you're having a difficult time with the situation there, persevere because you have to make it through. But it also means when you do make it through, it means you're reliable enough to deal with bullshit. In a world full of oversensitive bitches, brutal honesty is refreshing. How can musicians get better if everyone keeps praising their mediocrity to spare their feelings? Well, it's like the movie Whiplash. They said something very profound in there, and that's like the two most devastating words in the English language are good job. If, you know, everybody's being praised for mediocrity, nobody's going to push themselves, and we don't get interesting things, and then we get shit like auto-tune and drum samples and all the rest of the nonsense we've got going on these days instead of people making actual fucking art. What's the point in perfecting everything anyway? It seems there's no point in playing the instrument to begin with, as you may as well just build it all out of software. I couldn't have said it better myself, you know? I, I look at some bands, it's like, why did you guys even bother miking up a drum set if you're just gonna replace everything? Save the time, save the expense, just fucking program everything, that way you'll get your perfect performances and the rest of us can go take a nap. My attempt at being in one of these angry comment videos, but I'm a Canadian, so here it goes, haha. <laughs> 
Your glasses are occasionally slightly crooked. Sorry for being so rude. Cheers, bud. Oh, dude, I got no idea what you're talking about, eh? Every time I watch another episode of Stupid Musician Text, it's the studio version of what every good live engineer has had to deal with for years. Except we have drugs coming up to us asking if we're the DJ. Love the channel. Keep doing what you're doing. Hey, thanks for writing that, DC Steve. Really appreciate hearing from the guys on the other side of the trenches. Now, I've only done live sound a couple of times and always left me with a real bad taste in my mouth, mainly because the bands don't want to pay you for your work. They don't want you to pay you to bring all your gear in. And if you make a recording of the show, they certainly don't want to pay you for it. Oh, well, just give me a rough version. There is no rough version. Fuck you, pay me. You know, that was one thing. The other thing was I remember doing sound, you know, I did sound for these three fucking bands and, you know, got them on stage, did the show, and everything was nicely timed out, and I'm halfway through tearing down and some drunk chick's yelling at me, hey, sound guy, let him play a couple more songs. And it's like, I'm very disconnected half the fucking mics, and I'm trying to get the fuck out the door. And I got some drunk moron yelling at me to let their friend's band play more while they play their allotted 45 minutes or however long it was. It's just like, I don't know how you guys deal with it. It took me, it took a lot of me just, just to tell her to, just to not tell this woman to get the fuck out of my face and let me do my fucking job. So I do salute the live sound engineers for having to deal with that nonsense. You've got far more patience than I ever will. Glenn, do you have any suggestions on the drug drinking front when it comes to us disabled players? Because there's a lot of us out there that take medications to deal with pain function. You have years of experience, so I trust that maybe you have some suggestions. Some of us haven't tried. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Wow. Uh, that's something I totally didn't consider. So let me preface this by saying I'm absolutely not qualified to give you guys an answer in any way. I'm not a medical professional. So when I talk about drugs and alcohol at rehearsal, I'm mostly speaking, of, I'm, I'm actually speaking purely about recreational drugs and alcohol. <sighs> Here's the thing, if you're disabled and you need to take pills to get you through your fucking day because that's what your doctor prescribed, then do what you gotta do. Nobody's gonna look down on you for having to take your fucking pills because you're just trying to fucking make it. You know what I mean? It's like that, you've been prescribed that shit for a fucking reason and I wouldn't for a heartbeat wanna interfere with that any way at all. Um, if you've got questions about that, maybe try talking to your doctor and saying, hey, can we try something that isn't going to fuck me up completely when I'm at rehearsal? That kind of thing. Um, better to get advice from somebody like that than somebody from me when it comes to that subject. Um, but seriously, though, if you're disabled and you're a musician, holy fuck, my hat is off to you. Please keep doing what you do. That's just fucking amazing. That, that just completely blows my mind. Thanks so much for writing in, man. Glenn, do you think recording to a click sucks the life out of a track in any way? No, it's the edits we do after the track's been recorded and to line everything up fucking perfectly. That just destroys the life of the song. Coming from an orchestra background, I assumed that there would always be professionalism in rehearsals. Absolute culture shock when I found out how wrong I was. Yeah, the thing is, people in orchestras are usually there because they fucking earned it. And yeah, there's definitely a certain level of professionalism there. I go check out my, my cousin's band who plays, who plays Baroque and watching them do their thing is really astounding. And then you go to a rock session where guys are noodling and just, you know, generally being noisy idiots. Um, yeah, it, it is a big, big, big difference. Sorry you had such a culture shock, but unfortunately that's the way it is. But hopefully together we can change that and make the world a better place for all musicians and not just the classical ones. As for the Asking Alexandria comment, I had to just laugh. The part about nothing from the 70s could hold a candle to today's technicality was most entertaining. Pull up Van Halen's debut album and listen to Eruption. Bear in mind this piece was done on a homemade guitar in an analog studio and also bear in mind that the entire album was recorded live in the studio long before the birth of digital and auto-tune crap. Give it a listen. Although I'm sure it'll be more than your pea brain can comprehend, you can keep your cookie credit crap. I listen to real musicians and singers that don't need a crutch. Yeah, I would totally agree. That album was magnificent by any standards and they certainly didn't need a computer to fix things for them. Uh, while you're bringing that up, you know, uh, I'd also recommend Queen's Night at the Opera, Judas Priest, Sad Wings to Destiny, Iron Maiden, Peace of Mind. There's so much incredible music that was made before the digital era that is would still crush most modern metal bands like fucking Godzilla. Um, definitely get out there, check out some of those records if you haven't already. You don't know what you're missing. Do you ever record to an ADAT machine for the hell of it? I know that you've likely used them. Um, actually, no, I've never ever used an ADAT in my entire life. Strangely enough, I kind of missed the whole ADAT thing. I went from I went to college from 89 to 92 and we had a two inch 16 track Studer 
in the studio and I remember it was broken half the time so people had to work their sessions around that. Oh, that was a lot of fun. And the board didn't have any dynamics and it's just, oh, big fucking mess. And, but I didn't open my studio till 98, like the end of 98. I think I started recording digitally in the summer in 97. It took me about a year and a half before I was confident enough to actually start bringing clients in. But in that whole time, you know, the ADAT thing came and went from like 93, I think the ADAT came out. I could be wrong, somebody, somebody correct me if I'm wrong when the ADAT first appeared. But I remember there being a bunch of ADAT studios around town. But I remember 90, late 96, early 97, I started working with Metalithic Systems and their digital wings for audio platform. And it was one of the first PC multi-trackers that held multiple inputs. And it was pretty fucking basic and pretty rudimentary, especially by today's standards, but you weren't limited to ADAT. And ADATs were really fucking expensive back then. They were like $3,000 each or something like that. Then another $1,500 for a synchronizer if you wanted 16 tracks. Uh, the metal ethics system could do 128 tracks and that was really bleeding edge stuff back in the day. So I just went with that route and skipped the ADATs altogether. I wouldn't even know how to hook one up to be honest with you. Um, I'm curious, any of you guys out there, have you ever used the ADAT system? And what was your experience like? Let me know in the comments below. I'm really curious to see um, how many of you guys went through that whole era and uh, did you have any good results? All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. Thank you again for watching. You guys are the absolute fucking best audience in the world. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, please do. I do this show every Friday and I try and answer your comments and questions on recording to the best of my ability. So if you've got a question you'd really like an answer to leave a comment below and I will try to get to it. Once again, have an amazing weekend and until next time, Hasadiga Evil Eye. Hey guys, if you like the video, be sure to subscribe as I post every Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. If you want to learn more about recording, check out one of my tutorials or one of my gear reviews if you want the actual honest truth about a piece of equipment. Till next time, stay metal, my friends.